before I start. Um, okay, I think I'm done. So I hope you all see my presentation here. The idea today is that I'm gonna give you a very brief, rapid introduction of uh, time series analysis, mostly focused on four year analysis. Uh, the, the main reason for that is that's what I work on most of my time and I don't have too much experience on, on other time series analysis methods in, in the time domain. But as you will see, uh, going back and forth between the Fourier or the frequency and the time domains is, is something that we can do. Um, as a second note, I uploaded to the Slack channel the data that we're going to use. Most of it, we I have the codes in the in the notebooks of how I downloaded them. Uh, but the idea is that you, you can just you know, copy it or download it from the Slack channel and then have it in the, in the folder where you're, you're gonna be working on today. So I'm gonna give you uh, this introduction in, I don't know, depending on, on how many questions we have, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we'll go into the lab. We'll do some very basic examples and then we'll have more time in the breakout rooms so that we have you know, many more examples of, of what we can do with four year analysis uh, today and hopefully we'll have You'll, you won't finish necessarily, so we'll have time over the week or over the next few weeks to finish the, the lab or the breakout lab, or the homework. I haven't uploaded the, the breakout lab yet, but it will do in, in, a, in a couple of minutes uh, when we switch. Um, so anyway, what, what I'm showing you here is a time series. This is 24 hours of uh, seismic data from a station, I don't remember, I think it's Pasadena. And I just, uh, on the right hand side is four different versions, forms of estimating the power spectral density function of the time series on the left hand side. And as you, the ones who've done already the, the homework, you will notice that most of the stations uh, globally have this uh, two peaks in the frequency spectrum the power spectral density function. And uh, these two peaks are related to the double, uh, single and double frequency uh, micro seismic noise. But anyway, what, we're not gonna talk about that right now. So <clears throat> when we, what we do in geophysics or in seismology is that we use statistical methods to analyze some data. On the plot here, what I'm showing you is the, uh, compilation done by Tarabi and others uh, of fault and fracture lengths in a, a significant number of studies. And they just compile them here in this plot. Um, so we use this data to you know, figure out what the size of the faults are and what that would mean in terms of uh, seismic hazard, for example. Uh, so depending on the length of the fault, that's and at that length, you fit a particular magnitude, a maximum magnitude of an event if you, if you use some scaling relationships. But what in this particular case, we would be able to get out of the data is to figure out what the probability of finding a given length of a fault is uh, depending on the different parameters that, that, that we find or wherever we are in, in a fault area, in a fault area. Uh, here's another example. This is a collection of ages of Rose's participant. This is fake. I didn't ask you to give me your, your age. Um, as you will see, we all, some of us will be outliers, so we're not going to pay attention to those of us that are way down to the right-hand side. But most of you will be somewhere around 20 to 30 years old. I don't know. Um, again, this is fake data. So. <clears throat> There's about 100 people or 200 people in this plot. And this is just a simple histogram. So again, this is another data set, not geophysical, but a data set that we can, uh, that we try to analyze and get some information out of. Um, the feature of these two data sets that I just explained is that it doesn't really matter how or the order 
in which we uh, look at the data. Uh, I can just look at uh, the ages of, of people in, in the world in, 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 this, in this classroom um, based on age or based on uh, your last name or whatever feature, it doesn't really matter. The, the main statistical uh, features of, the, of this particular data doesn't change. Um, the same happens here with fault planes and fault lengths. It doesn't matter if I take study number one and then study number two and, and compile them or do it the other way around. It, it really is not relevant in this particular uh, type of data. But in time series analysis, there's something different. And mostly, uh, as seismologists, this is what we're going to deal with. So time series analysis is a, is a you know, relatively old, mature field in you know, statistical explanation methods. And one of the things I would like to highlight is that in many cases, uh, you know, we're not mastering it the, the, the way we should. And this is something I would like to uh, encourage you to do is to um, carefully study these this methods because this is what you're going to be doing in the, in the future for the rest of your seismologist life. And there's a number of branches. There's more than two, but in general, you can think of two uh, main branches of, of uh, time series analysis. One is uh, the one that uses the data in the time domain or in the space domain, the methods are similar. So we're, we're thinking in seismology in time, uh, but you could think of it as also in space, it's just a, a different domain. Uh, we're gonna focus on time and frequency, but we could have uh, space and wave number domains as well. So there's the time series, the time domain uh, methods or the frequency domain methods, or the methods that are in, employ the frequency domain. Uh, the plots are just showing you two examples of you know, earthquake source, an earthquake source problem in the time domain on the left hand side or in the frequency domain on the right hand side. And uh, they are equivalent in, in a way. Uh, and it depends on what you want to do and what's more appropriate to your problem, which one you would uh, use. In seismology in particular, we use the frequency domain quite a bit. And as you will see with the examples we'll, we'll do, um, you can go back and forth between time and frequency domain. But it's not, it, you'll, as you'll see, uh, you can go back and forth. That doesn't mean you have the, uh, the solution that you always want. The precision or the bias that you will get is not zero. So we will study, study data seismic data in which the order is important. What, what do I mean by important here? Um, the, the order of the data points is relevant in this particular case. And we're gonna describe it with, with X's. You know, the first point is X sub one, X sub two, X sub three. Um, if you're thinking of Python, then it's X sub zero, sub one, sub two, up to N minus one. So we're gonna switch between the two notations uh, quite a bit. But this is a time series. Uh, we have indexes which represent the sample points uh, n and they, this n represents the time point or the position in time of each of these observ observed data points, x's. Um, in most cases, we will get out of uh, OpsPy or whatever other tool you get of your instruments will get uniformly sampled data. Um, this is typical and um, many times we just assume this is the case. Uh, most of the tools I'll, I'm gonna talk about assume you have uniformly sampled data and that's you know, one limitation when you, when you uh, have data in space, that's slightly different. So the problem is, is a little bit more complex when you don't have uniformly sampled data or you have missing data points. That's also something that uh, is important to, to take into account, but we're gonna assume uh, this is not gonna happen to, to our data. So let's go back to the original example. And let's think about now that we don't really have a function, but we have 
a random variable in the you know, time series. Uh, so the, the example I started with, we have the collection of ages of our participants in the, Rose, in, in the Roses classroom. And uh, the ages are uh, uh, whatever, if I put all of you and all the statistical information in a magic hat and you just pull out one person, one age, one data point out of that uh, hat, then I have an, an actual statistical probability density function, a statistical distribution of uh, my random variables. And I pull somebody and I say, okay, that person is 28 years old, right? What's the probability of having exactly 28.000 years old? The probability is in fact zero. From the probability density function, what we can say is what is the probability that somebody, like my experiment, when I pull somebody out of the hat, is gonna be between 28 and 29, then I, I might be able to say something. So I can do this experiment many times, repeat it many times, and at the end we'll have some sort of data-based uh, histogram that I can use to infer the probability density function, which I, I don't really know, and um, draw some conclusions out of it. Right? I can do this experiment many times and pull out uh, every time a, a, a data point, an X, you know, a random variable, and then figure out what the PDF is. It doesn't really matter if I start uh, with the first data point or the last data point. In this case, the position or the time that I take out each of the numbers here uh, doesn't really matter. But when we're dealing, okay, so anyway. Um, so when I do this experiment of pulling somebody out of the hat, then that's, we'll call it a realization of, of, my, uh, of my experiment. And uh, whatever comes out, comes out of a probability density function that we usually don't, don't really know. That's the probability density function of the underlying process. And uh, if you have enough data, you, you can try and figure out what the expected value of that probability density function is. If you have a Gaussian PDF, then that would be, that, that would be your mu, your, your average value is this x, x bar. And you can also try and figure out what the variance is, or the first moment, the second moment, the third moment, and so on. If you have a Gaussian distribution, you only need the first moments. Well, this is different when you talk about time series analysis. Again, we're gonna deal with a data series that's now drawn from a uh, statistical distribution that we don't know. We want to figure it out, but we don't know it. And when I pull out something out of a hat, what I pull is not a single data point. What I pull really is one of these traces. It's a one realization of the time series, of the, of the stochastic process that's behind that, that probability density function. So when I pull this out, I don't pull a, a data point and then I put another one and another one and I just paste them together. Now, in reality, what's happening is that when you pull something out of the hat, uh, you get an entire time series. Why? Because the position in time of each data point is important. That's in contrast to the previous example. It wasn't really important. This, in this case, it is important. So here, I designed a stochastic process, it doesn't matter which one it is, and I pulled six realizations of this. I did six experiments of this. So the order is important, and when you think of it, what's really happening is that you, you get realizations of the entire time series, not just single data points. Um, so that's basically what this is saying. Uh, this uh, realization is drawn from an ensemble of all kinds of alternative time series that uh, are described by whatever probability density function we have. Um, so the next question is similar to what happened with the ages of roses participants. 
what is the expected value of uh, my experiments of my, my statistical distribution at some point n, at some data point, time point n. So this is that, that little box here. What's the expected value of that? Well, when you do this experiment with, with the Gaussian distribution in, in the examples before, just try to draw as many experiments as you can and you get the uh, Assuming it's a Gaussian, you get the average of the, of the samples, and that would be something that's close, or an estimate at least, of the expected value of your uh, statistical uh, data point of your uh, stochastic process. The problem here is that uh, in order to do that, we'll have to pull out not just one, but many time series, and then compare the times that we're interested in and average between all these different experiments. So it's not just taking the first five points or 100 points of my time series and then average them. That's not really what we could do, what we should do. Uh, we, in principle, should be averaging vertically in this plot uh, to get an idea of the expected value or the second moment or the third moments of your uh, probability density function. Uh, of course, this is, this is not very useful because we only have one experiment. We only have one seismic record at, at a certain point in time. So um, that idea of putting many traces is, is not viable. And the second problem is, even if you have a single one, you could still try to describe it. So this is the equation that describes uh, multivariable um, Gaussian PDF. Um, so we have here the data points in time minus the average of those data points. And here the C is the covariance matrix. So we have a very large covariance matrix uh, n by n. So if let's say we have about 50 points, if you put the numbers here, you, in order to describe this PDF, you would need about 1,300 data uh, parameters something like a thousand parameters or more. So it's really intractable. You can't really do it. We can't uh, describe a 50 data points with a thousand parameters because we don't have the, the information to be able to get the entire probability density function. When you look at the example before, in order to describe the probability density function, we need just the two parameters, if it's a Gaussian, the mu, and the variance that would describe completely a PDF. So even in the simplest example, which is a Gaussian distribution, one of the simplest examples, um, the time series uh, case would be too large. So, that's an go. And now what should we do? Well, we can assume some more uh, restrictive conditions of, our, of the time series we're gonna be looking at. And in most cases for Fourier analysis, we assume the processes that we're looking at are stationary processes. What does it mean? Well, it means that um, the actual even though the, the time series varies over time, so it's not just some data points uh, organized with, uh, randomly, they do vary over time, but the underlying the stat statistical description of the entire time series is time invariant. What does it mean that the mean value, for example, or the expected value of that random number, that random variable, will not change over time, will be always be the same. It doesn't mean that the that the data is always constant because that wouldn't make any sense, uh, but that the expected value is independent of where you're looking at in the time domain. On top of that, uh, the second moment, which is the second equation here, uh, is also time invariant. So both the expected value and the uh, second moment are time invariant. So they're always constant, those two uh, expected values are constant. 
The third equation here shows you the covariance. Right? In, in our previous case of the Gaussian distribution, the covariance is zero. Right? If, if one student is older, the other student doesn't need to be you know, older or younger, they're completely uncorrelated. In uh, this case, for a time series, um, two data points here, x sub m, x sub n, are not necessarily in, uh, uncorrelated. There's a covariance between the two. But now this covariance doesn't depend on the absolute times between the two data, of the two data points, but actually the distance between the two data points, n minus n. Right? So this here, this covariance, is only dependent on the relative position of the two data points. Uh, if they're closer, they're usually similar. If they're further away, you, know, you would expect them to be less correlated. Um, but it's not dependent on the absolute time position. Um, so this is the kind of re more restrictive kind of class of random processes that we're gonna be looking at. And uh, it's such an advantage that this, this set of uh, characteristics of the statistical distribution of the, of the random process that we're gonna be looking at, that we even try to make data look stationary. So for example, removing the trend. Of course, if your seismometer has an, um, some sort of instrumental drift and the amplitude is increasing with time, it's non-stationary. Uh, but you just remove that trend and you get, a, in principle, uh, a stationary process all the characteristics that we're talking about here. So here are our time series, the ones I, I created with some statistical decision that I'm not gonna show you. But uh, on the right hand side, I'm just showing you the covariance matrix, this third number here, um, this third expected values at the moment here. So the covariance uh, for the first phase, the one and the the first trace, I think, is the one, the upper trace with itself, right? with just m being zero and then the rest being just moving, uh, n just moving to the right hand side. Um, here's the time delay, so the difference n minus n, and this is the estimate of the covariance, the black one. And the red one is the same, but now doing the covariance of the first trace with the second trace. What you see is that obviously the covariance at, at lag zero, where n minus n equals zero, then it's, it's yeah, basically the variance, which is this number here of the, of the trace. Um, but as you move towards the right or towards the left, meaning uh, you're comparing two points that are separated by some distance, uh, you see that it's not falling off to zero. It's still, significantly different than zero. And it, even if you look at the red one, that means the n minus n is further from 50, even larger uh, seconds, you see that the, it has some sort of you know, periodicity. It's going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Why? Because even though the stochastic process is composed of random variables, that doesn't mean it's completely unpredictable we can infer some of the statistical characteristics, characteristics of the data uh, of this random process by looking at things like the uh, covariance shown here. Okay, so take home message number one. We are studying data in which the order that this data is organized is important. You can't just take a little piece here and paste it here and take another one and 50% of this one and then take this one. Then it will destroy completely all the uh, statistical information that is contained in a single trace. So that's one, one thing uh, that's important. We unfortunately only get one realization of our process. So we get 24 hours of a process, but that's the only 24 hours. We don't have that. We can't repeat the experiment necessarily. Uh, and in order to make statistics a little bit simpler, we make a major assumption. And the assumption is that the random process is a stationary stochastic process. So that's uh, 
the first thing we I want you to remember from from this uh, part. I don't know, Francisca, if there are questions yet or if you guys want me to continue. No question. We can keep okay. continuing on. So let's move into Fourier theory. This, most of the things I'm gonna show you are from notes I made and from classes I took from, from people at Scripps, at, at UC San Diego, um, Bob Parker, Kat, Kat Gunstwell, Frank Vernon, and uh, you know, Peter Scher, and, and a lot of people are, most of them are still there. Um, and we will be discussing a number of terms. Uh, we're gonna be talking about frequency or wave number domains, frequency and wave number. We're gonna be talking about spectrum and what, what it means, so what it represents. So hopefully most of these things you'll uh, have heard before. Uh, we're gonna be doing some really quick filtering. I'm not gonna talk much about filtering, uh, but I'll show you some examples of how to do it. And the terms like coherence and impulse response functions and transfer functions and things like that, that, that I think we've heard uh, last, last week as well. We're gonna try and, and explain what, how, how you get them uh, using Fourier theory. Um, so hopefully you feel comfortable with them. If not, you know, you can ask questions about it, but uh, if you're not comfortable with them, you, you should. And uh, you know, maybe you should read about that a little bit because they're gonna be very important in your future career, uh, no matter what kind of seismology you do. Uh, this is just an example of, of an estimate of the coherence as a function of frequency and you know, very, no, not very old, but 30 years old paper. Okay, so here's the definition of the Fourier transform. There's a few definitions that you can see in books. Sometimes they have a, an omega in them being the circular frequency, which is equal to two pi f, f being the frequency. Here in my notation, F is a function. Capital F means the Fourier transform, or that F with a hat <coughs> represents the Fourier transform of the function F. T is gonna be time and new. Here this looks like, an, like a V, and that it's new, uh, represents the frequency, right? So that you keep that notation in, in mind. Um, there's others where you have one over two pi here outside or inside. I think this is the nicest definition in the sense that, uh, as you will see, the forward transform and the inverse transform are equivalent. Or, you know, they have the same, there's no uh, fudge factor outside the interval or anything like that. So what this does is that it takes a time series, which is this f over t, or f as a function of t, a continuous and uh, continuously sampled and infinitely long time series, which we don't have, and we'll deal with that in a moment. And you multiply by e to the minus two pi i nu t, two pi i f t if you want, and you integrate over time and you get the Fourier transform, which is a function of frequency, right? So that's what it does. Uh, in our case, most of our input data series are gonna be real. So the Fourier transform takes a real function and converts it into a function as a function of frequency that's complex, complex value uh, with respect to frequency. So you can think of this as a linear mapping. You take a time series in some domain in time domain and you map it into another domain that we call frequency. So what does it mean? I think the best way to explain it is to do the reverse. How do we construct a, a time series? Well, we can construct it by doing the inverse Fourier transform. Look at the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. It's the same as the, uh, as the Fourier transform, but except there's a plus sign here in the exponential. That's the only difference. So it's a nice way to define it because you don't have to remember any fudge factors to get the units right. It's just a positive or negative. Negative is Fourier transform e to the plus sign is the inverse Fourier transform. 
So how do we construct this? Well, uh, as you might know, the e to the plus or minus term here is equivalent to having a cosine plus e i cosine of, of the term two pi f t or two pi mu t plus the imaginary part of the sine of the two pi mu t. So this term here inside the integral is equivalent to just creating a signal multiplying a, a scaling factor here v f I mean f hat uh, multiplied by a cosine or a sine. So if you want to create a real signal f of t out of this, uh, you just put a, for a given frequency nu, you just put zero or one or two or whatever amplitude you want, and then you can construct this f of t. So imagine this f hat is zero everywhere except at a frequency five hertz. So the integral here is just the, the integral of zero times what all everything is zero except at frequency nu equals five hertz. So you have here one times e to the two pi i of t. Um, so one here times the cosine plus some sine. Term. So depending on what the phase is, you will basically have a sine wave in the time domain uh, with a frequency equal to um, nu or with a period equal to one over nu. Uh, so that's one, to, that's one way to think about it. Now, if you want to get more complex signals, then you just add more uh, complexity to the f hat function. So let's do that. Uh, this again is, the, is repeating the equation below. This is the inverse Fourier transform. We're going to create a, a function here, f hat. We're going to call it g hat as a function of, of um, frequency nu. And we're gonna define it as a Gaussian. So here is this Gaussian e to the v minus v naught. So it's a Gaussian centered around frequency v naught, uh, nu naught, I guess. And it has a variance or a width, that Gaussian has a width equivalent to sigma. Okay. So that's the, the, the plot of that signal in the frequency domain. Let's take the Fourier transform of this. Uh, when I was a student, this was, you were supposed to be able to do this by hand. Now, I, I don't remember how to do it. I remember it was possible. But anyway, if you do it, this is the result. Um, so it looks complicated. Yeah, don't, don't think much about this, this uh, touch factor here, but it uh, has two exponentials. Right. The first, the second one here is e to the two pi i nu naught t. So this is a sine function. We are a, a combination of a real part cosine and an imaginary part sine. But this is simply a sine function with frequency nu naught. So it's a single frequency sine that's infinitely long from minus that to that. That is multiplied by this term here, this term here, if you think about it, is the same as this one here, except that there's not this, there isn't this uh, term in the denomin denominator two sigma squared, that, that term is gone. It's not, there's nothing to divide by. But that, what that means is that the uh, width of the, of that Gaussian, this here is a Gaussian again, the width of, a Ga of this Gaussian is not one over sigma, it's not related to sigma, but rather one over sigma. So it's the reverse width. So here is that, so what we basically have is a sine function, which is the first term here, multiplied by a Gaussian. The width of that Gaussian is not one over two sigma squared, but it's rather uh, rephrase. The width of the Gaussian is not sigma, it's one over sigma. So it's much wider in this particular case. So you get something that's wider. And if you look here at this, uh, the periodicity of this uh, signal here, and you measure it, this width or this distance between the repeating sinusoids, heels and flops, is one over the frequency 
of the uh, DAO center. So let's change it. Let's just change sigma. It's exactly the same function, but now we're going to make the, the, the Gaussian be a little bit wider in the frequency domain. So we make this a little bit wider. We again calculate this uh, Fourier transform, and you get something that looks like this. Uh, by the way, the, the dashed line is the imaginary part, the uh, continuous line is the real part, so cosine and sine. Uh, and what you see is that when I make the frequency domain wider, it makes the time domain uh, narrower. Okay, so that's one feature of the, of the Fourier transform. Uh, something that's very long, it makes it very narrow in one domain and the other. Um, so here are a few theorems or rules of the Fourier transform. Some of them will use uh, extensively. Uh, the first one is called the Parseval's or Power Theorem, and it just says that the um, sum of the squared uh, sigma in the time domain is equal to the sum of the squares of the frequency. So basically the variance of the radian in time domain is, is proportional to the uh, sum of the power spectra. In the, in the frequency domain. So this is an important rule and we're gonna use it in a, in a moment. Um, there's other theorems, I'm not gonna list them all. Uh, this is one that might be important because uh, it shows, or I'm not proving it, but the Fourier transform of the derivative of a function f is simply uh, the Fourier transform of the original function f multiplied by two pi i nu. So something where you had to, a derivative is now simply a multiplication by, by two pi i and frequency. So it's um, not simple, so uh, go ahead. Pardon me, Herman. Yeah, we have a question here uh, in the chat. It says, so with greater precision in frequency, does that imply greater <laughs> uncertainty in time and? Yes. Yes, exactly true. So I'll show you in a minute, but basically there's nothing free in this world. If you want to have really good time resolution, then you're gonna have to accept uh, losing resolution in the frequency domain. Or the other way around. If you really want something in the frequency domain very narrow, you're gonna lose resolution in time. Uh, I'll show you in a minute what, what the term looks like. Uh, what we call that, that's the, uh, I just forgot what we call it, but it's basically, uh, there's no way you can get infinite resolution in time and frequency domains at the same time. Okay, so the, the advantage of this derivative theorem is that if you have an, you know, uh, some sort of differential equation that you're gonna be looking at, you, and you can get the, for the transform of the, of the F function, then you reduce that maybe more complex uh, differential equation <coughs> to uh, simply a multiplication in, in the other domain. And then you can go back. Uh, so going back and forth between the two domains is possible. So many codes actually that do differential equations use the Fourier domain because it makes it easier and faster. Um, there's another, um, theorem, it's called the convolution theorem. So first let's look at convolution, but I think we, we looked at that uh, last week where you have a seismometer that has an impulse response. Right? And we call this impulse response U, so U as a function of time. So if you have a, a wave arriving, uh, there's nothing happening and then a wave arrives and then nothing happens next, then your uh, the signal that you record from the seismometer depends heavily on the impulse response of the instrument. And we now know how to construct that <coughs> from last week. Uh, now, in reality, we get a signal that's a seismogram, a sub T, that, that's what we want to understand. Maybe we wanna look at the earthquake source properties or the noise properties we want to look at. Uh, tomography, uh, and then we need to be able to pick the signals really accurately, whatever you want to do. 
uh, you want to get this, the original signal out of the seismometer, but it's convolved with the input response of the instrument. And other things like attenuation and whatnot. But anyway, this is a combination. So this is the definition of that convolution, the, the convolution of the original time series that comes into the seismometer, the input response of the seismometer, and then you integrate from minus infinity to infinity. I put here T sub zero because it, you should only come uh, integrate to, to the point where the, when the wave arrives, um, but because in, uh, instruments are, are casual, 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 um, you know, they don't know what's coming, they don't predict what's coming up next. So the interval to T sub zero is equal to the interval to infinity. But anyway, this is the definition that we looked at last week of the convolution. And we write it in, in a applied math with this uh, term here, this asterisk uh, term here. So this is uh, represents the convolution of S and U to create uh, your recorded signal R. Um, and the convolution ther theorem basically says that the Fourier transform of the convolution is the same as multiplying the Fourier transforms of the two individual signals. The original signal S and the Fourier transform of the input response of the seismometer. So if this is convolution, well, then you get your answer what the convolution is. It's just dividing. And then if you divide it, then you can, you know, get S uh, out of the uh, recorded signal. And if you know the input response, you can get the original S signal. And then you fully transform back and you get your time series in principle. It's not that easy, but in principle, that's what we do. There are other uh, Fourier transform pairs, meaning, uh, as, I, as I showed you before, the Fourier transform for Gaussian, this is a different way of describing a Gaussian here, is again a Gaussian. Okay, and I showed you before that this was the case. Um, but there's other function that are interesting. There's something, it's, there's a signal or a function called the box car. The box car is simply zero everywhere except for a little chunk of time from minus a half to a half where that signal is one. So it's zero, then one, and then zero. It's called the box car because it looks like a box. Um, the Fourier transform of that is this function here, and this is called a sync function. Okay, and I'll show you what it looks like in a minute, but this is gonna be very, very important for us uh, in the near future. Um, so that means that the Fourier transfer of a sync is a box car, okay? So it, it, it goes both ways, there's uh, pairs of Fourier transforms. So here are other Fourier transforms. This is the sync, the, the one I just showed you here. Squared is uh, the Fourier transform that is a triangle. The uh, Fourier transform of a signal that's always one is just a delta function at frequency zero. The Fourier transform of a cosine is a delta function at the frequency of that of the uh, cosine, both of the positive and negative no. frequency. Yep. Any question? Okay, I'll continue. Uh, the same for a sine. Uh, sine function has its full transform. Look, this is the imaginary part. As, as you remember, the imaginary part is, is related to sine function. Look that the sine function is odd, so it's anti-symmetric with respect to zero. The cosine function is symmetric with respect to zero. So anyway, these are some, some of the rules that we have. And for example, here, a sine function, the frequency domain, the Fourier transform is uh, two delta functions in the tangle. So this Fourier transform pairs happen both ways. And you might wanna remember a few of them uh, for your interest. So take home message from the- Herman. It should be a two, yes. We have another question. So. Are these, transfer, <clears throat> are these transformations, for example, the constant delta, um, are they assuming infinite functions? And then what happens when they are not infinite? 
Okay, so yes, these examples here, uh, all of these examples here, so far, we're assuming it's infinite. What happens when it's not infinite, that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. So just wait for a minute and we'll get there. Um, okay, take home message number two. This should be a two. Uh, the Fourier transfer is in, in, it's inverse, it's sort of a linear mapping, and it would be good for you to you know, uh, take a look at some of the uh, transform pairs and what happens when you do something to the signal, etc. Um, an hour signal in one domain represents a broad signal in the other domain. So that's called the uncertainty principle. So you can't have, as somebody asked, you can't have both infinite time and frequency resolutions. So if somebody tells you that they can do this, uh, they're lying. It's impossible. It just can't happen. You can try to you know, get better time resolution in some ways and improve the resolution in the frequency domain in other ways, but you can't do both. Uh, nothing is free in, in this world. Um, anyway, so when I was a student, I had to prove some of these theorems by hand, and uh, I'm not expecting you to do that right now, but it, it's a good idea to try it. It shouldn't be too bad. So for the second question, what happens when it's not infinite? And worst of all, what happens with the fact that you don't have a continuous function, but you have a function or a data that is discretely sampled? So we have really three problems. Computers don't like to do integrals. Right? They do sums. Uh, you can make it the sum with a little, little steps. That's fine, but you can't do integrals. And especially you can't do integrals from minus infinity to infinity because the computer won't, won't be able to converge ever. Um, our data is discretized and our data is finite length. So there's a few problems here, of differences with what we just saw. So we're gonna to try to deal with those. And I'm gonna tell you what happens, which is basically the question we just had. So here are the Fourier transform for the, this, for this, the discrete version of the Fourier transform, um, the forward Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. I will call it the VFT, meaning the discrete Fourier transform. And look, it's you know pretty simple. It's the same as the, as the one with the integral, except there's for the, invert, for the direct Fourier, or the forward Fourier transform, you have to have this one over n just to keep the units correct. And you have your data points now sampled uh, every delta t, every certain data point. We're assuming here that delta t is one sample per second. Uh, e to the minus two pi i n, n nu, and now you divide by n just to normalize the, the function. And the inverse Fourier, discrete Fourier transform is this one here. So you, again, go back and forth between the two without any problems. So many times we think, okay, because I can go back and forth, that means that what we just learned with the Fourier transfer for continuous signal is, applies exactly the same. That's the point I wanna highlight today. Don't assume that's the case, because it's, it's not. So, we have a stationary random process, right? Now it's finite depth. So what happens? So our Fourier transform usually was from minus infinity to infinity. And before we had an F here, right, a function. But in reality, we have a, a random process. So if you take a random process, a random stationary stochastic process, and you transform it with some, with a linear mapping, like the Fourier transform, your output is also going to be a stationary random process. So it's not telling us much about the statistics of your original time series. Um, so we, we, we need to improve that. Uh, th this x hat here is still a random process. So not very useful for statistics, unless we do something with it. Right? And the second point here in this equation is that the integral is now not from minus infinity to infinity, but from minus t to t. So what happens then? Um, so, okay, we want to find something about the statistical distribution of the data. Uh, so we want to estimate the expected value of the uh, frequency domain uh, transform 
at a certain frequency, we want to get the square of that uh, of that uh, x uh, x hat, and we want to know the expected value of that. So what's the expected value? So the variance, the second moment. What's the expected value of that? So to do that, we define then that the expected value of that as t goes to infinity, which tends to infinity, which is what we would have if we would have the infinitely long time series. Um, that's something we will call the power, of sp power spectral density function. This is the one we, we had as a homework to plot. So this is the power spectral density function. It's the limit as t goes to infinity of the expected value of the transform squared. So you put that into the Fourier transform. Here is the time domain. You Fourier transform it from minus t to t, and then you divide by two over t. Uh, so this is the definition of the power spectral density function. Still, we're still doing integrals, right? So that's not exactly what we have. So going back to the question we were asked, what happens when, in reality, you get a time series that's not infinitely long and it's also discretely sample. So these pictures here, I, I took that from my Spanish book that I really liked the way they presented it, um, explains that in, in, in eight plots. So let's start with this. So what we have, imagine you have a time, like infinitely long and continuous, function that's zero up to here and then goes up and then dies down in an exponential decay. Um, it's, so you, it's a function, it's infinitely long, it's continuous, you take the Fourier transform and this is the Fourier transform of that. This is what you would want to get even if you had a discreetly and short-lived uh, time series, right? Okay, so let's do the following. Imagine that we multiply this signal by another signal that's zero, except at one at time one, zero, and then at time two is one, and then zero. So we multiply by a bunch of uh, zero everywhere except at the sampling points. So this would be the time domain version of that function. That's also infinitely long, but it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, etc. So what's the Fourier transform of this? Uh, well, it's uh, in the frequency domain that would be a signal at zero everywhere except at this frequency here, this frequency here, and at frequency equal to zero. Uh, the, this frequency here of one of those, um, of the right hand side, what's the frequency here? Well, it depends on the sampling rate. So if this is one second, this peak here would be at one hertz. Okay, and the same here would be at minus one hertz. So, in order to get a discretely sampled version of your continuous function, you multiply this by this, okay? And then you get a discretely sampled function. Um, the problem here is that multiplication in the time domain is what in the frequency domain. Remember one of our definitions that the convolution theorem, well, as the name suggests, is the convolution of this and this. So the convolution of this and this in the frequency domain is this. So look at just by discreetly sampling, you're, you're already having something different from the original Fourier transform. Uh, and what you see is here, up to 0.5 hertz, up to the middle of the sampling rate, you get the same impulse response or the same frequency uh, spectra as the original series, but then it goes back up and comes down and it goes back up and comes down and so on, infinitely long. So you, in reality, you only get up to the Nyquist frequency, up to half of the sampling rate. You get the... <coughs> Herman, we have a, a, another question. Sure. So the question is, what is the meaning of a negative frequency? Oh, um, huh. for, for real input, for, 
I guess I didn't explain it, but for a real input signal, when you take the Fourier transform, uh, negative and positive frequencies don't are symmetric. If you have a complex function, then they are not necessarily going to be symmetric. So a symmetric Fourier transform uh, generates a real um, time domain function. And the other way around, an anti-symmetric uh, spectra generates a completely imaginary time series. So this two trade off. Uh, so the negative frequency in in our case, for a real input signal is is irrelevant in this case, but but in uh, in reality it has to do with the symmetry of the time series uh, when, when you're looking at, at frequency and time domains. So in in, a, in our case, most of the cases we are only interested in the positive frequency band uh, because the other one is just symmetric, but in uh, you know data that is complex, uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, okay, so we're, we're up to here, right? Just the effect of sampling already, you know, starting to screw up our, our, our Fourier transform. Now the next thing is we still have an infinitely long time series. Right? This is an exponential decay, but it decays takes a long time to decay and our seismic record only has 24 hours. So the next thing that, that we could do is say, okay, we have now a discreetly sampled signal, but it's infinitely long. So now let's multiply by zero and then one and then zero. So the cases where it's one, all this uh, sample data will still be the same, but the ones that are over here are zero and zero. So um, by multiplying the signal by a box card, so that's why I show you the box card. Uh, the full transfer of a box card is a sync function. So when we multiply this signal here with this with this box card, it's equivalent to convolving it in the frequency domain. So now the spectrum that looked fine now it's convolved with a sync. Okay, so that's called spectral leakage. I'll show you a few examples in a minute. So the Fourier transform is uh, now not only is repeating itself somehow, it's also biased a little bit because of this, of this convolution with the sync function. Anyway, it, it goes on because the DFT generates a frequency that's sampled in frequency as well. So this is what this part is showing. But in the end, the basic idea is that you really have a short-lived time series that's uniformly sampled. It generates a short time, a short frequency band uh, uh, spectrum that if the input is real, it's symmetric. So you only require up to the Nyquist frequency. And um, it's also discreetly sampled. But um, this picture here in G is, effect of TNF sampling here also shows you what the DFT is thinking. When you give the DFT a short-lived function of, I don't know, let's say 10 points, what it will think or what it will do is shown here. It will assume the 10 data points that you're giving it, it going to be replicated infinitely long to the left-hand side and infinitely long to the left-hand side. So it's going to paste it and uh, together, 10 points and then the next 10 points and the next 10 points and so on. So this is really what you're giving the DFT uh, to compute your, your FFT. So that's a problem because what you're giving it is something that dies down and then suddenly jumps and then goes down and then suddenly jumps. So that's also something we need to take into account. Uh, hey, when we're trying to compute the DFT. Yes. Uh, we have another question. So the, the finiteness of the signal is the one that creates the spectral leakage? That's the question. The finiteness, yes. The, the fact that it's not infinitely long. Yes. And, and there's another question related that says, can we think of spectral leakage as the contamination of our spectral 
estimate due to the window function we need for the discrete uh, Fourier transform. You guys are asking questions that I'm going to answer in a minute. So, so we'll get there. I'll show you spectral leakage in a minute. So yes, the, the answer is yes, but, but let me just show you what, what it looks like, what this spectral leakage looks like. Okay, so here's spectral leakage, there you go. Um, so the way we compute the Fourier transform here of this random X signal is we take the X signal, we uh, multiply by a taper or window. Um, in general, we multiply by a signal that is once everywhere, right? The box curve. So this A could be just once. And then we multiply by two by IF and then yeah, this is just the DFT. And what we want is to estimate the, the power spectral density function and as I showed you before, it's just taking the square of the FFT signal here. That's great. That's you know, this will give you a number, but as you see, it's, it's an estimate. Now this hat here represents that it's an estimate. Why, it is, an, why is it an estimate? Because if you use something called the Kramer spectral representation, which I'm not gonna show you, um, I'll explain, but basically from the spectral representation, representation, you can show that the estimate of doing this here is equivalent to having the true spectrum, but it's being convolved, the true spectrum being, if we go back here, taking this spectrum here, and convolving it with the uh, FFT of your window, of your boxcar in this case, squared and then integral. So if you look at this and you do the math here of doing a, as a function of f squared, uh, your spectrum is convolved, your real spectrum is convolved with something that's called the Fedger kernel. It, it's very close to a sink kernel square. It's not exactly the same, but it's very close to a sink square. So this is what it looks like. This is the convolution function, the convolving function of your true spectrum with that convolving function that generates your data. So this is your data. This is the, the estimate of the power spectral density function. So take into account that you're not really getting S, you're getting an estimate of S, and that estimate is a convolved version of the real spectrum. So, you know, the, that you guys that do inverse theory, you can think of ways of doing this inverse problem, but there's no single solution to, to that. So let me show you what it, what it means, what it, what it looks like. I'm gonna, uh, show you the examples and I'm gonna just do the prediction, the forward problem uh, here. I'm gonna define an S myself and I'm just gonna convolve it with this and then generate what you would see if you calculated the spectrum of the data. With three tapers, one that's just a box curve, so once and then zero everywhere. One that's a Hanning taper, it's sort of a sign taper uh, smoothed in some way. And then one that's called the prolate taper, which is the taper that uses, that, that's used in multi-taper spectrum estimation techniques. So there's just three tapers. There's tons more, but I'm just showing you three examples. So here, in this plot here, I'm showing you from the Nyquist minus half the Nyquist to plus half the Nyquist. This is the FFT of the three windows of the window. The box curve window is the blue one. The orange one is the Hanning taper and the green one is the prolate taper. And what you see is that this is, these functions here are convolved with the original spectrum. So, okay, imagine you have something at zero frequency, that's fine, but it's leak, I mean, the energy that is here at 0.5 Hertz is also convolved or leaked. That's why it's called spectral leakage. leakage into the estimate at frequency zero. And when you zoom in, I'm just zooming in into the first part here. When you zoom in, when you do the boxcar taper, you know, uh, at 0 0.06 Hertz distance from the frequency of interest, you have maybe just a reduction of about 10% to maybe 100, uh, to, to maybe 1% of the energy 
uh, with respect to the original frequency. So if the signal at 0.6 hertz is 100 times larger than the frequency of interest, then all the energy is really coming from here and not from the frequency that you're interested in. If you use the Pauli taper, which is you know, the best one in, in, in some particular way of describing it, you can see that this, the, this difference in amplitude is about a million times smaller at the same distance. So this is a much better way of calculating the power spectrum density function. It's less biased. It's still biased, but it's less biased. Uh, now again, as we said before, there's nothing free in this world. So the product tip is better here, but you can see that the averaging is wider. So the, the first lobe is much larger uh, for the poly taper than the, for the Hanning taper than for the um, box car taper. Okay, so uh, you're having to decide on, between the trade off of spectral leakage from very far away distances, frequencies versus resolution. That's, that's a trade off that you have to decide at some point. Uh, I'll show you three examples here of worst case scenario. Um, I created a fake spectrum signal. So I created this S and I'm just showing you amplitude instead of power, but just, just to show you with four uh, sinusoidal functions for peaks in the spectrum, one at 0.1, one at 0.2 and one at 0.3 and 0.31 or something. Uh, again, the three tapers are applied, and you can see that in this case, it looks like the box star taper is better because it shows the three, the four peaks, and these two peaks that are close together, look, you can actually separate them very nicely. While the other two tapers do fine in the first two, but in this two, they merge them together somehow, right? And even in the green one, it suggest that there's a single peak in the middle between the two, which is not true. So, you know, the local resolution is, is worse than for the, for the box cut paper. Um, and I'm just showing you here the, the log domain scale of, of that same plot in the plot, just to show you what happens next. So this is the same exact signal, but now I decided that this frequency at 0.2 Hertz is uh, five times, 500 times larger in amplitude. And this is something not uncommon in seismology. Uh, okay, so you can see in all the three cases, you get the peak very well, but what about the other four peaks? Do we see them? If you take, now we'll take the log just because this one yeah, erases everything we see here. By taking the log here, the blue one, which is the boxcar taper, doesn't even see this peak and barely sees this peak, the first of the two. That's called spectral leakage. And that's a really bad case of spectral leakage. Look instead, the, the Hanning taper and the other, and the poly taper, they do see this peak here very nicely and they do see this, you know, merged peaks here. So they don't improve in the distance here, but, but at least they do show that there is a peak here which the uh, box car taper doesn't because of this bias of the sink squared function of the fragile curve. So you better basically always take it, please. Here's another example in, in more seismological terms. Well, the other one could be seismological too. Uh, this is the function of what you would expect from a source spectrum with a, you know, a circular fault with some size and uh, kinematic, uh, a kinematic source with, with a circular patch. This is the moment and this is the corner frequency. Uh, so the red curve is the original spectrum that you expect to see. So if we convolve it with the, with the taper function, um, what you see is that if you use the Hanning taper or the Pauli taper, you do a fine job. But if you don't use any taper at all, you get a significant bias, and this is very significant. So you know this is displacement spectrum. So if you put it into velocity square and integrate, the radiated energies will, will be completely different and completely biased. So 
it's important to always use a token. Right? That's sort of my take home message, the most important take home message. You know, you can use the multi paper tools that, you know, there's codes around, there's a Python package uh, of my codes from Fortran if you don't want to learn Fortran. Um, but MATLAB has them. Uh, anyway, or use a uh, handing paper, it doesn't matter, but at least use a paper. That's, that's sort of my take home message, too. Now, the other problem with the PSD is that when you estimate it, assume you have a spectrum that's flat, the expected value of your PSD is the variance of the data, which is exactly what you would expect. Uh, but the second moment, the variance of, the, of your PSD is sigma to the four. So basically you have an expected value an estimate of your spectrum of one uh, with a standard deviation of one. So your error bar is as big as your, your spectrum. Um, so that's not really useful. So uh, the problem here is that it doesn't matter how large you make your data set. This is still true. So it's the, the way we're calculating the power spectral density function is inconsistent in the sense that as you put more data points, it doesn't improve the variance. And so this happens in, in non, in colored spectra as well. So the variance of your estimate is proportional to your power spectral density function anyways. So you need to uh, smooth things somehow. So because of the way the DFT is, is constructed, uh, you can average different frequency points, and that way you reduce the variance in, in some way. But, but you always have to do this, because otherwise the variance of your spectral estimate is going to be as large as your, as, your, as your amplitude or power spectral density uh, value. So that's why if you go back to, to last, last session, you saw the spectrum of a signal and it's very noisy. You know? It's not a nice function of frequency. It's, it's very noisy because the variance of the estimate is, is, is not very good. Okay, so before we start the labs, um, because we're not dealing with, with, a continu with a continuous and infinitely long signal, we have to acknowledge that what we're doing is not exactly a Fourier transform. So please pay attention to that. Second, uh, your estimates are biased. Because basically because time is not infinite. Um, so it's biased because it's convolved with the, with the taper response. Um, and if you don't use any taper, it's not like you're not using any taper. You're using a taper that's a box count which is the worst taper to use. So always use a taper. Um, the variance is proportional to the power. So you need to average somehow. Average between nearby frequencies is possible. We're going to do it. Use all types of methods, multi-taper methods, for example, or uh, use uh, Walsh's method, which is take different smaller windows and average them. Like that's another possibility to reduce the variance of the of your estimate of the power spectral density function. Um, so we're going to move into the practice. Um, this is more or less what we want to do. I don't know how slow I've been, pretty slow. Um, but we'll move into the lab. Um, are there any questions before we do that? Yeah, we got a, a couple of questions here in the chat. So it says, uh, in your experience, it's how high can we go in the frequencies we can really trust when we analyze earthquake spectra, um, especially especially when we're dealing with small earthquakes with with a high corner frequency. It says, for example, using a broadband station with a 100 hertz sample rate, um, what could be the highest frequency that we can really trust? Obviously, you know, less than the 50 hertz Nyquist uh, to analyze the earthquake spectrum. Okay, um, that's a an important question, and I learned that the hard way when I was a student. Um, because of what we heard last time, the way uh, the instruments are, are constructed and the data is, is generated, um, 
the, the, when it's going to become digitized, they apply a sort of um, filters to avoid aliasing. I didn't talk about aliasing, we talked about it last week a little bit, but to avoid aliasing, which is a really, really big problem if you want to do it, they apply some filters before. So usually it's, it's I don't think there's a rule, but it's uh, a good practice to always, when studying the spectra of a digitized signal that has a very good um, anti-alias filter, uh, you would go to about 80% of the, of the Nyquist. So if 50 hertz is your Nyquist, you would go to about 40, more or less. And that, I think in the examples I'll show you, or we'll have, you can see that uh, the spectrum behaves really nicely and then it drops down really quickly. And that's probably the, the anti-alias filtering kicking up, kicking in. So about 80% of the Nyquist is a good, it's good practice, let's say. And then uh, actually another question about the multi-taper um, method. So we saw on your, your first slide of your presentation, this comparison with different tapers and numbers of tapers. And I was wondering if you could briefly um, explain how the multi-taper method works and, and sort of why we might want to use it or what the advantages might be. Okay. Um... Let me see. Okay, so here. Um, the basic idea, as I said, is that the variance of the power spectral density function is, is large, right? So the way to deal with that is to average estimates that are hopefully independent. Um, so you can average over nearby frequencies. If you use the DFT correctly, they are, they are independent, but they are only independent if the spectrum is flat. But anyway, okay, so you need to average them to get a better behaved estimate of the power spectral density function. So what we do in the multi-tipper world is that instead of multiplying the, the signal with a single taper, like a handing taper, we multiply it by a different taper that's called a pullet. So we multiply with this function here, this green one. There's no difference between having, I mean, there's a little bit of difference, but there's no gain in terms of variance if you use uh, the green one or the, or the orange one. What to do next? Okay, so now uh, you could find another taper and multiply it again with another taper. So you get a second estimate of, of y of f with a second taper. Now, it's, you can't really combine, sorry, going back and forth, combine the purple estimate and the green estimate just like that because they won't be independent or statistically independent. So uh, many years ago, um, applied mathematicians in Bell Labs uh, that were looking at uh, communications and things like that. In Bell Labs was the, this big lab with, with a bunch of uh, Nobel Prizes and whatnot. Uh, they defined a collection of tapers that are um, orthogonal. They're called the slipping tapers or the prolate functions. Uh, so the second paper, I, I, I don't have it here, but, but I can show it to you the, in, the, in the lab. The second paper is, is orthogonal to this one. And the third paper is orthogonal to this one and to the second one. So they, you can have lots of orthogonal functions or, or papers that you can use to multiply your time series, take the FFT, and that means that your YFs are you have a bunch of estimates of the same YF with orthogonal functions. So the estimates are in principle also orthogonal. And then when you average them, you get, you reduce your uh, resolution, uh, you reduce your variance significantly. That's the basic idea of the tapers. Now, the, the problem is you can't use any taper because right? uh, sometimes when you use a taper like this, 
your leakage is too large. So you might be averaging and getting your, your variance reduced, but you increase the bias. So there's this trade-off between resolution and bias. So the, the multi-taper algorithm, what it does, it, it computes lots of, not lots, but a few uh, spectral estimates with different tapers or internal tapers, and then sums them, trying to be careful not to introduce too much bias. And so that, that's what it does. There's two main uh, algorithms, one that's called the, you know, the typical uh, multi-taper, which uses this polyps. There's another one that's, it's not really new, it's been since I was a student, I guess, at least. It's called the sign multi-taper, which has lots of tapers, many more than the multi-taper, the original multi-taper. They have worse leakage reduction properties, but you have lots of them. So you reduce the spectra quite a bit. So that's why if you, sorry, going back this all the way to the beginning. So this is using a single taper and you see the, the amount of variance of your estimate. When you use the multi-taper, there's are two versions of the multi-taper. You can check out my papers in 2007 and 2009, somewhere around there. Uh, you reduce the variance significantly without introducing bias. Uh, and this one here is really smooth. It has significant bias though. You can see that this bump here, which is related to the average of the data is, you know, significantly large compared to the multi-taper or the single paper. So it introduces a significant bias, but it's, you know, very smooth. So it's another way to, to deal with, with this type of signals. Thank you for that answer. And we have uh, another question here, which is, uh, is, long, is a longer time series, does a longer time series have less influence? Um, is it less influenced by, by tape, the taper issue or boxcar taper or, or, or um, spectral leakage? Okay, so the short answer is yes, but up to a point. So. Uh, this is done for uh, 100 points, but you could do it for 1,000 points and it will go down a little bit. But, but for example, the, the boxcar taper will still be really flat. Maybe you know, the amplitude is going to be reduced, but it's still going to be sensitive to you know, frequencies all the way down to the Nyquist. Um, so even if you have a very long time series, still try to do a, try to apply a taper. Maybe you can apply a taper, you know, 5% cosine or something that reduces, that significantly reduces the, the, the leakage uh, quite a bit and it reduces it continuously as you go away and away. The, the boxcar taper effect is that this, you can see it here, it's really flat and will continue to be flat forever. So, you know, still, I would still, uh, propose you, you 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 use it. You use some kind of taper. I prefer the multi taper, but that you know I'm biased. I, I wrote it. Well, I wrote it based on something that was already written. But that's what that was my PhD thesis. Okay. Any other questions? I guess, let me try and share my screen now.